Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Professor Gordon. Our guest speaker today is speaking to us about trust. Trust in institutions, trust in dialogue, trust in knowledge, trust in museums. In a time like we live through, dominated by fear, anxiety, and insecurity, trust seems to me to take on a new value, a new importance. This talk is the first in a series of expert talks in relation to the House of European History's temporary exhibition, Fake for Real, an exhibition that is all about different methods which undermine trust. Fakes, forgeries, falsifications, conspiracy theories were used to earn money, to earn power, to survive persecution, to win wars, or to reach political goals. For centuries, these methods, as our exhibition shows, were based on the capacity of the human brain to be deceived. By unveiling fakes and forgeries, our exhibition claims indirectly to hold the truth, questioning what is real and what is fake, what is a real document or an artwork or a falsified one can be seen as a test of the principles of historical and museum work to question the veracity of a historical document, the accuracy of a text and the authenticity of a curatorial statement. This reflection of our temporary exhibition goes to the heart of what Professor Gordon has been researching, the credibility of knowledge institutions, such as universities and museums, has actually been dwindling. How can we rebuild trust in them, Professor Gordon asks. Surprisingly, he comes to very different answers than what one would uh, traditionally assume. When previously, trust was built by the authoritative voice of the curator. In Professor Gordon's view, trust is built by co-creation. It is by participating themselves in a meaningful process that the visitors would regain trust. The process, therefore, instead of being a means to an end, seems to become an end in itself. I am very curious to learn more about how museums can be redesigned to build up more trust. Because if there's anything that can help a building the future with confidence, it is exactly that, trust. So I look forward to this evening's lecture and I will now hand over to my colleague, Eva Gutmann, who will introduce Professor Gordon. Professor Gordon, thank you so much for being with the House of European History tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Itzel. Uh, before I uh, further introduce our speaker, I would like to thank you all for following our live stream and encourage you to pose any topic, uh, any topic related questions you might have to the to the stuff that you will hear or to our exhibition in our chat bar on our YouTube channel. So, uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce a uh, background of Professor Gordon. Let me open with the quote from the article that was published earlier this year by the Rolling Stone magazine in January, uh, which was uh, questioning, quote, why is expertise important to us? In an age of fake news and distrust, polarizing opinions and diminishing middle ground, true expertise carries even greater weight. Having non-politicized experts Tell us what happened in the past, how artists express the invisible, and what could happen in the future. Keeps us sane and at peace, and at peace with, it, with, it, with each other." End of quote. This is why we're honored to share this expertise of Professor Gordon with all of you today watching our online event. Eric Gordon is visiting professor in the Comparative Media Studies Department. Massachusetts Institute and is also a professor at Emerson College and the director of the Engagement Lab in Boston, Massachusetts. His research focuses on transformation of public life and governance in digital culture and incorporation of play and care in collaborative design processes. For the last 10 years, Professor Gordon has explored how game systems and playful processes can change traditional models of civic participation. He has served as an expert advisor for local and national governments, as well as NGOs around the world, designing responsive processes and helping organizations to transform and meet the stated values. He has created over a dozen games for public sector use and advised organizations um, how to increase their values. Professor Gordon, 
We're very honored to have you here with us today and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you for joining us from Boston. Uh, thank you both uh, for, for that really lovely introduction and for the, and the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure uh, to be able to speak to you um, this, this afternoon. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen, so give me one second. Okay, so my talk today is called From Lockbox to Sandbox, How Playful Design Can Rebuild Trust in Institutions That Produce and Keep Knowledge. Um, just a little bit more of a background on, on me. Uh, as, as already mentioned, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a designer, uh, I'm a practitioner, and I'm a scholar. Um, and my work is focused on the transformation of governance structures in legacy institutions through playful design. Now I'm gonna throw out the word legacy institutions and I don't mean that to be a derogatory in any way. I mean that as a means of understanding the kinds of institutions that, that we're dealing with. Um, and, we can un and we can sort of loosely see them as legacy institutions who have been around for, for some time and, and, and emergent ones. So across the board, these core institutions are losing trust. Uh, we can look to the modes of decision-making and the history of past abuses of power as perhaps some, um, some reason for that happening. Each of these institutions is a broker of how we know what we know. There are certain presumptions that guide how they work. We trust the news because it is selected by editors. We trust policy because it is presided over by government officials. We trust the articulation of history or even the curation of art because it is selected by museum curators. And we trust science simply because it emerged out of universities. But this logic can be faulty because these sentiments can no longer be relied on. For example, I believe in climate change. Now I've not read all the climate science, um, but I have faith in the universities and the institutions that produce it. And, and why wouldn't I? Why, why wouldn't I? Those institutions have served me relatively well in, in my life. But what about those people who have not historically been served well by these legacy institutions? They're disengaging when possible, they're disbelieving when desirable, and they're creating new institutions, new forms of news creation and gathering, new forms of telling history, new ways of forming and keeping knowledge. So there's two questions we can ask now. How do we build new institutions? And, and how can legacy institutions remain relevant? So to the latter question, the answer is simple. By transforming what they do, why they do it, and for whom. Institutions cannot remain impenetrable fortresses in which the publics they serve have no access to editorial and programmatic decisions. Put simply, this is a broken communication infrastructure. Lack of access creates the conditions for, uh, for dis and misinformation because of the plausible deniability of any claim emerging from these institutions. Government says the COVID vaccine is safe with no particular evidence to the contrary, some groups say it is not uh, because they fundamentally distrust the institution from which the information arises. So this is not necessarily a lie. It is simply a narrative that gets to coexist with the dominant one. And so I wanna draw a distinction um, between a lie and other forms of information. So even in low trust environments, institutions are capable of dispelling lies by providing evidence to the contrary. So here's a picture of an apple. Uh, and if I say this is not a picture of an apple, um, that, that seems like a lie. It's a negation of a truth, um, being that the apple is right there, there is evidence for that apple, and I can say that this is not a picture of an apple. And it's not too unreasonable to think that an institution say, well, yes, it is. It is a, a picture of an apple. Um, we have evidence that, that that apple exists. So a lie is different than what the philosopher uh, Harry Frankfurt calls bullshit. He says, for the essence of bullshit is not that it is false, but that it is phony. In order to appreciate this distinction, one, one must recognize that a fake or a phony need not be in any respect, apart from authenticity itself, inferior to the real thing. What is not genuine need also be defective in some other way, need, need not also be defective in some other way. It may be, after all, an exact copy. So what's wrong with a counterfeit is not what it is like, but how it was made. 
So this points to a similar and fundamental aspect of the essential nature of bullshit. Although it is produced without concern with the truth, it need not be false. So we can look to an example such as the former uh, US president saying, I turn on one of the networks and they show an empty field. I'm like, wait a minute, I made a speech. I looked out, the field was, it looked like a million, million and a half people, right? So this is, that there is, you know, one interpretation of this is that it is a lie. Another interpretation of this is that it is a, a, a an obfuscation or an alternative, um, a, a counterfeit, let's say. Um, and I think this is an important distinction for a number of reasons. Institutions, as I've said, are good at dispelling lies, but unless people trust in them, they can do very little to protect themselves against the alternative. So my talk today will attempt to answer this question. How are legacy institutions transforming what they do and how they do it so that they can build trust and maintain relevance and legitimacy? Go. This is a picture of an apple. Now it makes sense to you. Um, all right. Let me move on to this. What do we trust? So according to the to sociologist, Robert Putnam, there are two levels of trust, thin and thick. Thin trust are the trust in the rules of the road, general trust that people are not going to stab you when walking down the street or cars are not going to hit you. It's the thin trust that enables us to sort of operate in our, in our daily lives. And then there's something called thick trust. And that thick trust is more personal. It's based on experience. Um, it's typically associated with a person or a small or finite group of people. And so we can understand this as, as insti insti if institutions are moral frameworks and organizations are the entities that play out those frameworks, in general, we have thin trust in institutions and we develop thick trust with organizations. But of course they're related. So how one feels about an institution such as journalism can bleed over into how one feels about an organization. Um, especially dominant ones. So this lack of trust is not new, right? Organizations uh, were understood to be trustworthy when they served the mass audience or the public. So the New York Times, for example, historically has been able to think about its public, the public, um, and, and, and it served the public, which was a mass of undifferentiated people. Well, of course that was never true. Right? There was never just one public. There were, there were micro publics that existed that were, that were never served by the New York Times in this case. Um, but it didn't matter to the organization because they didn't need to address those, those micro publics. They just weren't a big enough factor or they didn't have a big enough voice in order to, uh, in order to actually differentiate uh, the work of the organization. But with new communication channels, the center of gravity has switched and organizations are faced with the need to actually address the needs of emerging publics, people and voices who have been excluded in the past. That's a fundamental shift that we're looking at right now. So this is not just a crisis of business models though. This is not just a, an organization like the New York Times saying we can't make this work anymore. I'm not saying that that's true, but they, they're saying that they, it, it's not just business models not working, it's a crisis of value models. And what that means is that there's a, there's a fundamental disconnect between what the organization does and, and the ways in which that organization um, creates and maintains legitimacy within the social construct. So this is actually um, demonstrated by the recent, by last year's Edelman Trust Barometer. Um, and this is a really interesting graphic. So what, what this demonstrates is that no institution um, and, and they're looking at, at government, media, NGOs, and business, no institution is seen as both competent and ethical. So the only one that is, the only one is seen, and this is a global survey, the only one that is seen as, as, as ethical are NGOs, and the only one that's seen as competent are businesses. Media and government are both um, incompetent and unethical. Um, and that's a, that's a real challenge, right? That's where we're starting from. And that's why, um, well, I tell you today is important. Institutions need to figure out what to invest in. So um, they can continue to invest in hard power, which are the buildings and the assets uh, and the sort of various other mechanisms of legitimacy that, that, um, that we're used to, 
or soft power, which is, which is trust and, and community and, and collaboration. So building the sandbox, the move from the lockbox to the sandbox requires an, an emphasis on soft power uh, that reinforces thinking, rethinking structures of decision-making and program facilitation. That means being open to new ideas and having structures to incorporate them. So over the last decade, we can look again to journalism as a, as, as a guidepost here. Journalism organizations have made significant strides in building soft power with their audiences. Um, one, uh, one dimension that uh, is often used to describe this is engagement journalism. And according to media shift jobs and engagement uh, with engagement or, or whatever they're called within media organizations have increased even while traditional reporting jobs have declined. Um, and, and, you know, again and again, what we're seeing is that there, the, the desire and the need for news organizations to actually think about their interface with audiences and not just deliver, um, deliver the goods in the way that they've been delivering the goods is, inc is increasingly important to the bottom line of those organizations. So the business model comes together with the value model. And some examples of this. So, um, so from Capital Public Radio in Sacramento, California, uh, Jessica Maria Ross, uh, who is the head of engagement there says, journalism as I understand it doesn't lend itself to a campaign or to a discussion, even of pros and cons. It's not so much a model that's about generating discussion. It's about generating perspectives and a space to hear the perspectives and make connections or note gaps and develop the relationships that can go forward. Or another example from Chicago, Illinois, by, um, by one of the founders of City Bureau, I don't know if we're necessarily part of the fabric of the community yet. I think that's going to take a long time, but I definitely think it's a mutually beneficial relationship where we try to assess needs around information and issues that they care about and then try to go back and do reporting or do some sort of project that when we just bring back and have dialogue around, and help inform folks to make better decisions. So ultimately, this is a reconsideration of the role of journalism, not so much as a distribution of information, but rather as a, a, a dialogic, as a means of engaging people in understanding and sourcing the stories that are important to communities. So, if, so it, again, in journalism, we're seeing some really interesting moves um, in, this, in this regard. And this is also true for other institutions. Universities are investing in different models of pedagogy and research. Um, we, have, we have examples of government investing in collaborative mechanisms uh, in order to sort of bridge the gap between, uh, between institutions and, and constituents. And then increasingly we have cultural institutions that are beginning to think the same way, not so much in, de in, in um, denying uh, authority um, or, or rather expertise, but in, in opening up the possibility and making it not a zero sum game, rather instead a positive sum game that can benefit from, from multiple expertises. Now, but there is a challenge here. So as, as, as organizations and institutions begin to invest in this, we, we end up sort of falling back into something that was actually first, uh, first pointed out by, um, by planning scholar Sherry Arnstein in 1969, um, in her um, now famous ladder of, of citizen participation. So in, in, in her seminal work, uh, she introduced the con this concept of a ladder of participation where consultation was on a low rung that she described as tokenism. 50 years later, despite changing rhetoric, this is still how institutions govern. Decision makers consult with publics and overly exclusive public engagements, and then they often retreat to a black box where they make decisions. Uh, as a result, there exists deep mistrust right, in, in, the, in these institutions because of the nature and the, and the process by which decisions get made. And I think as we look around the world now, the pandemic has only heightened those divisions, drawing attention to the structural inequities that limit an institution's ability to act. So I'm not suggesting that institutions engage in a new barrage or rather a renewed barrage of public engagement campaigns. That's not good for anyone actually. That's simply consultation as Arnstein says, and perhaps even tokenism. I'm suggesting that institutions fundamentally reconsider their back end structure. I'm suggesting that they reconsider how they govern. So, oh, 
According to Jerry Stoker, governance refers to the rules and forms that guide collective decision-making. Um, that the focus is on decision-making in the collective implies that governance is not about one individual making a decision, but rather about groups of individuals or organizations or systems of organizations making decisions. Instead of traditional models of engagement and consultation, where we uh, perhaps tokenistically consult with publics in order to get opinions about a thing that's going to happen in any case, in this case, what I'm suggesting is that if we look at back end infrastructures and actually open up so that we might transform the way that we govern, the way that decisions are made um, is a necessary um, move at this point in time. So my recent book with Gabriel Mugar from IDEO called Meaningful Inefficiencies argues that public serving organizations instead of merely seeking the most efficient way to deliver goods and services, need to deliberately and conscientiously design inefficiencies into systems so that people can build trust in procedures through trusting each other. This includes transparency in the use of data, non-extractive relational modes of consultation, and an explicit commitment to investing more in those that need more. We argue in this book that public institutions transform through the deliberate creation of relational spaces. And we see in moments of crisis that if that, that, if that relational infrastructure doesn't exist, governing defaults to top-down procedures and fails to care for publics. So building this infrastructure is not an easy or cheap thing to do. Typical institutional reform is focused on enhanced efficiency and more reliable transactions. But I'm gonna argue that while this was never enough, the efficiency ethic is particularly limited at this moment. Any reform that seeks to repair public serving organizations without considering the mechanics of the institutions interfacing with publics is merely amplifying the crisis of institutional mistrust we find ourselves in today. So here's the framework that we lay out in the book that I'm gonna to describe to you um, this afternoon. Institutions become trustworthy when they can demonstrate that they care for and with the publics they serve. It's as simple as that. I don't trust the news when I believe its motivations are conflicting with mine. I don't trust science when I believe that the institution does not serve me. All right, so let me break this down and I'm gonna start very quickly with what I mean by publics. Now I've already said, um, I've already said some of this, uh, a public, according to John Dewey, is the means by which individuals speak for the group. So how does this happen? How do people come to accept themselves as part of a public? And how, do, how, how are organizations changing what they do to accommodate multiple and overlapping publics? So understanding where identity converges across publics and how to be responsive is the work in front of us. Um, now, this is different. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a problem with my slides again. Um, this is this is different uh, than than previous modes of of um, of sort of design interventions. Now, what we have seen in in a range of different institutions is the incorporation of human centered design into into the work that's done. And sometimes um, the incorporation of of human centered design workshops into the procedures of of, of institutional transformation um, can be tokenistic. Um, and and at worst exploitative, um, and so and what I and what I mean by that is that it, it, it's performative, right? We can we can hold a, a, a user a user centered design workshop, but um, but if we're not actually committed to changing the way that decisions get made, nothing much will happen. So what I and and what what's important here, the important shift in thinking about publics instead of humans, individual humans rather is that institutions need to understand their users as individuals, yes, but also as connected to groups with particular and often competing interests. And so that's something to that, that institutions have to be able to actually hold um, as part of the transformation process, that, that we, we are going to work with individual people, but they represent groups um, that may or may not, that are coming to the table with, with different, um, different contexts of trust or mistrust. So let me talk about care. Care is both the goal and the method of institutional transformation. And I'm gonna say a few words about 
levels of care. So feminist scholars have for decades um, been looking at care as both a interpersonal and political um, manifestation or construct. And uh, I just want to describe the way in which care um, is articulated within, uh, within the literature and then, and then uh, describe how it applies to institutional transformation. So when we think about care, we can think about um, the, 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 mo the easiest thing to think about is caring about, right? So that's attentiveness, attentiveness to a person or an issue. And, and that's, that's, that's relatively easy. And institutions are relatively easy or relatively good at that, right? We can, um, uh, or an organization can care about a particular, a particular issue and invest some money in that thing, for example. Um, so that, that's, that's a caring about, it's a demonstration of attentiveness uh, to an issue. Care for is a little bit more difficult in that it requires reciprocity. That's, that's taking the caring about relation or, or rather the, the caring about phenomenon and then making that relational. So now all of a sudden, the thing that there is a there is the one who is caring and then the one who is cared for, and that becomes a relational dynamic. That's more difficult for organizations to actually um, uh, to do. Uh, and then the, the other levels of care, caregiving and care receiving are important. Caregiving is the actual action of providing care and care receiving is the receiving of care, the response to that action. And what, what scholars have done for, for years is actually put care receiving um, a, 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 at a higher rung um, than caregiving. It requires a, a far a more sophisticated level of, um, a, a, of interaction um, than, than is even taking that action, that, that initial caregiving. So here's where, the, where I really wanna go with this. Um, Joan Tronto, who is a who is a political uh, political philosopher, political scientist, um, has written about care for some time, and she's written about a concept called caring democracy. And she says that the world exists not of individuals who are the starting point for intellectual reflection, but of humans who are always in relation to others. And she says this: she says democracy is the distribution of caring responsibilities. So I want to just. Let that sit for a second. If democracy is the distribution of caring responsibilities, and if that becomes the role that organizations need to take within a democratic context, all organizations, right? I mean, all, all public serving organizations, whether we're talking about journalism or government or, or universities or museums, there is a responsibility to the distribution of caring responsibilities. And what I've done in my work is I've, uh, as I've I, I've identified it, the idea of careful governance and what that looks like. And so what I call careful governance is a way of thinking about the mechanics of prioritization and decision-making on a city scale or on a, on, on a larger scale, more than an organization that decenters government influence while incorporating all sectors in the distribution of caring responsibilities. So that's key, right? What it means to care, what it means for, for institutions to care, that shift requires a, um, a prioritization, um, uh, it re requires a look at the mechanics of decision-making that decenters traditional institutional power. And this, going back to Joan Tronto, she says that caring institutions, um, she says that, that it, it means something very particular for institutions to care. The family or the private sphere was up until the modern era, the center of all care provision, health, education, personal fulfillment, care was domestic labor, and largely isolated to the home. But this began to change in the late 19th century as industrialization and changing labor necessitated that public institutions claim some responsibility for the public's care. So as Hannah Arendt argues, the transfer of care from private to public happens in parallel to women's liberation beyond the private sphere, her right to work, her right to vote. So moving caring responsibilities out of the home contributed to the imagination of public institutions as sharing in these formally private responsibilities. So there are four dimensions of careful governance that I wanna, I wanna point to. Who sets the agenda? How is power acknowledged? How are decisions reached? And what are the goals of the organization in its, in its decision-making? Is it focused on policy or, or, program, or program building? Or is it actually focused on care distribution? Meaning is it actually serving the publics um, that, that come to the, the, the organization or the institution? All right. 
what I've established so far is that we need to look at publics as our as our core object of of transformation. Publics as opposed to the to the singular user. The goal of all design and, and institutional transformation is care. Um, we, and we we and because care is the pathway to trust. And then the way we get there um, is through structuring playful environments. And here's what I mean by that. I'm going to start with a quote from probably the most famous play theorist named Johann Lizinga. And he says, play is a free activity standing quite consciously outside ordinary life as being not serious, but at the same time absorbing the player intensely and utterly. It is an activity connected with no material interest and no profit can be gained from it. It proceeds with its own proper boundaries of time and space according to fixed rules and in an orderly manner. It promotes the formation of social groupings, which tend to surround themselves with secrecy and distress their difference from the common world by disguise or other means. In other, world, in other words, when we play, we step outside of everyday life, we abide by a different set of rules um, in what uh, Wazinga calls the magic circle, and we are able to freely explore and safely explore within that space of play. Um, that as a design consideration, the ability for organizations within the work that they do to create spaces of play that are safe, exploratory, um, open to possibilities and discovery. That is the way that both people form communities with each other and begin to form trusting relationships with the organizations that they're engaged with. I'm gonna give you one other, one other definition of, of play and specifically games as a structuring device for institutions. And this is by the philosopher Bernard Suits. And he says, to play a game is to engage in activity directed towards bringing about a specific state of affairs using only means permitted by rules, where the rules prohibit more efficient in favor of less efficient means, and where such rules are accepted just because they make possible such activity. So put in another way, all games are by definition inefficient. They, because they put unnecessary obstacles in our way to complete our tasks. So in the case of golf, which is what Bernard Sood says, the most efficient way of getting that ball in the little hole would be to pick up the little ball, walk over to the little hole and drop it in. But instead of that, instead of doing that, we create all these unnecessary obstacles in our path. Uh, we have to hit the ball with a long stick. We have to, um, we, put, we put sand and trees in the way. Um, so that we do that so that we can play is what Bernard Suits says. And that the goal of any game is to play the game. And so I want you to think about that in an institutional context. What does that mean for institutions or, or, or organizations to be thinking about the design of, of interaction between publics and them as creating these spaces of play that are by definition inefficient and the goal of that, of the goal of that experience is to play. The goal is to step into, voluntarily step into a safe environment for the purpose of exploration. Now, the reason that's important um, is because those are the kinds of condi conditions that create trust, not when people are pushed into systems, uh, pushed into efficient systems that get them to their end goal as fast as possible. That's typically the way that institutions operate. Um, and, and this conscious decision to design what I call meaningful inefficiencies is absolutely essential. So this manifests itself in a number of different ways. Um, and one of the ways that we see, especially in the European policy sphere, are things called urban living laboratories. And these urban living laboratories are these kind of playful modes of experimentation that exist somewhere between government and cultural institutions and universities where publics uh, engage in experimentation and exploration around particular kinds of policy and or cultural issues. Um, these, uh, these urban living laboratories, again, they, they tend to be short lived, they, they, but, they, um, but they exist in a myriad of different forms. One being something like uh, participatory budgeting, which we see around the world. And then others focusing on things like housing policy and cultural representation. Um, so I want to point that out as a, as a, as a very compelling example of, of, of what were, um, you know, things, a, a form that have been around for over two decades. Generally, these urban living laboratories are, are um, inspired by the quadruple helix and in that they bring together multiple sectors. 
they engage in an experimental methodology, or I would call it a play-based methodology, and they're focused on open innovation where knowledge can be diffused across stakeholders. So what happens is through that process of discovery and experimentation, uh, knowledge gets diffused to the point where trust can be built with the, with the institutions that are represented within them. Um, so let me give you a few examples. And, and just quickly, I wanna go through an example, a project that, um, that uh, we designed in Boston called Betablocks. Uh, as an example of an urban living laboratory that used play as its core, um, and uh, and with, was intended to, to build trust in the institutions represented um, therein. So uh, the idea of um, what, what, we, what we were working, working with, the problem we were solving for was the relation between technology companies and the public sector and the role that the, that the community or publics had in decision-making about, um, about new technologies in the public realm. So beta blocks was a, was a way of inviting some friction through creating these spaces of, of play. There are multiple components that I'm not gonna belabor right now, but I just wanna kind of describe the, the complexity of the design of this, uh, of this framework. There are what we call exploration zones, which are designated spots in the city. There are four square block areas that were demarcated in the city of Boston. Um, and those areas were, were sites where we could relax permitting so that we can temporarily install technologies. There were advisory groups that were set up around each of those zones to, to, um, to provide some oversight um, over what went, what went in, um, and then to provide some creative lens as to how to think about problems within that space. There was a public exhibit that I'll show you in a second that was designed to generate public dialogue. Uh, there was a, a, a youth curriculum that was, that was um, developed as part of it. And then ultimately, the, it resulted in recommendations or collaborative decision making and governance. Um, again, uh, for those who may be familiar with the city of Boston, there were three zones that were designated in the city. Um, as I mentioned, these are approximately four square blocks. It had all these characteristics. They were, um, they were known to people as, as these relaxed permitting zones. Uh, each of them had an advisory group. Oops, sorry. Um, and then the advisory group would advise on certain technologies that would be placed um, in the city. So we, we some of the some of the technologies that we were that were in question were things like air quality sensors and, and urban screens. In addition to this, there were there's this traveling exhibit which we called the Beta Blob, which was a, a eight by um, twelve uh, inflatable structure that looked like this. Um, Sorry, I'll go back to that. And it it wandered around the city. It was a very huggable object that uh, people would be attracted to. Uh, and then in the object, there were opportunities to play games, to uh, to interact with interact with data about the technologies that were being uh, that were being installed, and generally to sit on comfortable um, uh, comfortable couches as people sort of explore the the role of technology within the urban um, within the public realm. Um, so an example, we took this thing to parks uh, and people sort of gather around it and, um, and made themselves at home uh, independent of the, of the goal of it being about um, technology. Uh, and then there was an exhibit at, at, at City Hall that displayed the structure and some of the findings that came um, from this traveling exhibit within, within the city. Uh, additionally, there was a youth curriculum that followed the, this exhibit around. Um, so a youth curriculum that was designed to specifically engage young people in, um, in understanding uh, what was at stake in decisions about technology in the public realm. And then finally, there were, there were sample recommendations that were provided to the city um, as, as a result of this kind of playful construct that we created. And I will say that the that what, what's important about this is not so much the novelty of the structure or even the novelty of the form, but it was specifically that the ability to create this, this, this play space, this meaningful inefficiency that people were able to enter into and explore. And again, as a result, um, starting from a place of distrust in government, government organizations and or the private sector, um, there, there began to be a sense of, of, of trust in these institutions, like there, there was a, a negotiation that was possible. And that, was, and that happened through the, 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 the very inefficient mode of um, uh, uh, how we went about this process. The, oh, God, sorry. 
my computer. So just a few more. Um, apologize, I'm not sure what's happening here. I just want to share one more example before I end. Uh, and this example is uh, a project called Participatory Pokemon Go. And this was an example of, um, this was a project that began with a, um, a, the acknowledgement that there was, um, there was, this is when, when Pokemon was a, was a big deal um, uh, around the world. What we noticed was that there was, there was actually a, a lack of equal distribution of the Pokestops um, around, the, around the city of Boston. Um, and and specifically, there were what we called pokey deserts um, were were in places that were socioeconomically disadvantaged. And so, you know, we saw again the, the sort of same inequalities that that um, that rise up, you know, during sort of any um, process of, of of data collection um, was very apparent even in Pokemon Go um, data. And so, what we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out a way specifically for um, for people or kids, specifically kids of color in certain parts of Boston to be able to actively engage with the pieces of the game that they were not engaging in. And that specifically was the designation of these markers in the city, these pokey stops in the city with, with, with very specific um, description of these, um, these, kind of these landmarks. That's essentially how they worked. And so we, we created a citywide um, process whereby we, we, we got young people together to rewrite the description of pokey stops. And so that instead of the, 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 um, the, the very short descriptions of, of landmarks within particular parts of the city and very long descriptions of, of landmarks within the historical downtown, um, we wanted to sort of shift that balance and create a kind of data equity um, within the city. And so as an example of something that came out of this, I just want to I just want to share this is something that was in the game. This is a mural that exists within a within the uh, Dudley Square area of Boston It's a um, primarily African American neighborhood in the city. Um, when and, and it's a it's a mural depicting um, it depicting specifically um, you know, African American uh, artists and and activists within the within the Boston area, the original um, description of this was BYCC mural 1995, and after the after the youth um, had a chance to um, to to go at this, they wrote this um, this locally famous mural created in 1995 was remodeled in 2015 to include more women. It has the faces of black activists that made a major contribution to the Roxbury Dudley area as it captures the essence of Dudley while emphasizing key black figures to promote pride within the community. And this was just one example of the kinds of things that happened when we created a kind of open environment, a playful environment for, for kids to sort of play outside of the bounds of the Pokemon Go game, but, to, but still be within that context. So we used the context of play to open up um, opportunities to build trust. And this was one of the results that, um, that emerged. So I just wanna end with, with a few thoughts. Um, Legacy institutions, and I, here I'm talking about again news and and uh, and, and universities and governments um, and cultural institutions um, need to invest in the building of soft power. This is a decision, right? There's a there's a decision to be made about um, about how to invest the resources that we have. They need to proactively and authentically care for their constituents and publics and actually bring the discourse of care into what it is that, the, that they see that the, the, the purpose of the institution being. Um, right now, that's, that's a word that's not really used, but ultimately, as I was saying before, that is the goal and the process of all organizational and institutional transformation. And then finally, they need to specifically employ the cultivation of play spaces. And, and here I mean meaningful inefficiencies to do this work that it's only through this, these kind of open spaces where people can interact, explore, learn, discover, create together, um, that we have the opportunity to slowly build back um, and, or, or create for the first time um, the trust that has been so, so sorely lacking. And with that, I thank you very much and look forward to a conversation. So thank you, Eric, for this, uh, for this inspiring talk. Um, yeah, thank you for not sharing the screen anymore. 
Um, so to the audience participating, I will briefly uh, introduce myself. I'm Guido Gerghaus. I work in the House of European History as a project manager in formal learning. In relation to this temporary exhibition, Fake for Real, we have introduced the online expert talk uh, called the, series, uh, the Flamboyant Fake that, that uh, Professor Eric Gorn just kicked off. Um, and in this series, of ex different, we invite different experts uh, to talk about their field of, of science and provide a short insight in their field of expertise. Um, I will now go to the second part of this online expert talk uh, and facilitate the question and answer segment. Uh, so to our audience, uh, please still share all your questions with us in the chat, uh, because I will try to raise as many questions as possible with Professor Eric Gordon in, in the next 20 minutes. Um, so Eric, we already got a few questions uh, in advance already, uh, but also some were raised in the, in the chat. Uh, so let's go to the first one that, uh, that has, been, uh, has been asked by, uh, by a viewer. Um, so the question is from, um, sorry, so the question is from uh, Felix Ciszewski. Uh, and Felix asks, uh, how can we address the problem of an institution serving the public? Uh, how can this be done with conflicting interests of the public? Conflicting interests of the public, is that the question? Uh, yes, so let me re rephrase. So yeah. the question is from Felix Ciszewski. So the question is, uh, how can we address the problem of an institution serving the public? And how can this be done with conflicting interest of the public? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, it, it's, it's a great question and it really gets to the core of the, of the challenge, this design challenge. Um, and it was what I was saying before about this sort of move from, from the public, the, the notion that universities, not just universities, but that institutions would, um, would become lazy in their understanding of who they served as the public. And that's no longer possible in most contexts, right? We're no, it's no longer possible. And, and you know, that has something to do with a, with a, a new media environment, right? Where where direct communication is far more um, possible than it, than it ever was. And so we have an emergence of, of, of let's say publics, right? This is why I go to the plural. Um, and so it is, it is now the responsibility of institutions to acknowledge the multiplicity of publics, to, not, to acknowledge the, the, the um, sort of radical disparity perhaps in, in, in what people want or need. Now, this is a huge challenge and it's potentially uh, paralyzing uh, for some, but it doesn't have to be um, because it actually provides, because it, it's, it's really fundamental to democratic institutions, right? That, that democratic institutions need to be able to hold multiplicity um, into, the, in, into their functioning. Um, and so when we think about how, um, how this happens, you know, this happens through, I'll say the traditional way in which this happened has been through kind of traditional modes of public engagement, which is, you know, we can hold, a, we can hold some sort of town hall or some sort of public event where we're gonna consult with the public and we're gonna get information. What I'm suggesting is that we need to go beyond that consultation. Um, we need to be able to, we need to be able to be transparent in the way in which in which decisions get made within that, within that institution. Again, not to deny expertise, not to defer all decisions to, to, a, um, to an undifferentiated public, but in fact, to engage um, the publics in which we serve or the audiences in which we serve in such a way where the, the activities of the institution become more relevant to them. And ultimately, you know, the, 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 the longevity, the, the resilience of legacy institutions is going to be dependent on our ability to do that. It's going to be dependent on our ability to be responsive, to be transparent, um, and ultimately to effectively communicate that the work of the, of the organization or the institution is benefiting and actually has the, the, the best interest of that person or that public in mind. And, and the last thing I'll say about this is that this is part of what needs to happen here is, a, is, a, um, is, is some kind of reparations, a, a, an acknowledgement of historical, um, uh, his, historical um, the historical ignoring of, of whole sectors of the population. 
um, you know, and this is true of minorities, it's been true of women, it's, it's, been tr it's certainly been true of, 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 of immigrants, that a lot of our legacy institutions have been able to function without acknowledging that multiplicity. That's just not possible anymore. Um, and so as challenging as this is, it's work that needs to happen. Okay, thank you. So, so we got a, another question, second one. Um, and this is from their only initials, it's from uh, EJV. Um, and the question is, um, isn't care distribution uh, that you used earlier, uh, or care provision, uh, a problematic top down turn? Mm. Yeah, so there are different ways of thinking about, about care. Um, you know, that there's, um, there's, a, there's a kind of care that is a paternalistic care. Um, that is, that is a, a care that is um, uh, a care that is provided by the, by the one in power um, and, and given to the one without power. So, so this, is, this is precisely the sort of you know, model of, of um, international development to sort of focused on this idea of care provision as a, as a sort of top-down um, concept. Interestingly, there is a you know there are what what's what's often called solicitous care is the idea that that care is actually um, care is not simply a um, it doesn't have to be sort of tied to this this kind of sort of anxiety about um, and and paternalism, um, but in fact can be um, can be relational. This is where Tronto and the, and feminist philosophers have really interrogated our understanding of, of, of care. Um, and actually this, this comes from um, Martin Heidegger, the philosopher Martin Heidegger, um, you know, in the, in the 19, um, in the teens, I actually wrote about the, um, wrote about what he, he, he made a distinction in care between what he called, um, what he called jumping in um, and then jumping ahead or, or leaping ahead. And, and so for him, what he meant by that was that, that there is a care that is where, where there's someone in need and you jump in to, to save whoever is in need. And then jumping ahead is where you jump ahead and, and allow, you would jump ahead of the person in need of care and allow that, that, um, allow that care to become essentially. So you allow, you provide agency in the, in the receiver of care. And that is an interesting distinction, right? Where care becomes, a di becomes the sort of cultivation of agency of the care receiver and not the, the disregard of agency of the care receiver. And again, like what, what, what's happened over the last several decades is that feminist philosophers have taken that the Heideggerian concept and really turned that into a care ethic so that now we can talk about care not as a paternalistic um, manifestation, but instead something that actually enables agency and an acknowledgement that every single person and every single organization is in need of care. Um, and once that is acknowledged, then we can also, we can talk about care and agency in the same breath. Thank you. Um, we have another question from, from Greg Bloom. Um, and he, after listening to your talk, uh, brings him back to the to the concept or to the mind of, of gamification, uh, which was popular, let's say, ten years ago. Uh, but it seems that you are getting uh, to a dip, to a different kind of concept or to something different. Um, could you speak to the overlap or um, or the different divergence uh, between the two concepts, please? Yep. Um, yeah. Great question. So gamification is, and and you're precisely right to point out that I'm speaking to a very different concept. Gamification, simply put, is the um, incorporation of game elements onto non-fun things, right? So we can think about like, um, you know, getting a badge or points for doing your laundry or the way that the way that uh, gamification systems are used in, you know, on factory floors, for, exa for example, to incentivize uh, to incentivize workers. Or we're very familiar with gamification systems and things like language learning, like Duolingo is a gamified system that is actually quite good at, at being a gamified system. Um, however, it's not playful. And this is the distinction, right? So a, a gamified system provides extrinsic rewards to accomplish a thing, but it doesn't necessarily provide any deeper insight or understanding um, or create any um, in, internalized um, system of, of motivation 
to keep doing that thing. It's, it's completely reliant upon the external thing. And I would say it is all focused on enhancing efficiency, increasing efficiency. That's what gamification for the most part does. I'm interested in, in, in what I call meaningful inefficiencies. I'm interested in just the opposite where it's not about putting game elements onto you know, non-game systems, um, but in fact, it's about, uh, it's about creating a meaningful structure to enable play. So that doesn't mean getting people from one point to another like a gamified system does. It means creating that sandbox, creating the opportunity such that people don't feel don't feel lost, don't feel ignored, feel like they're, they're, they're um, uh, productive and, and discovering within that context, but they're not being led along a path towards the preconceived goal. They are, the goal it emerges within, this, within the meaningfully inefficient or playful context. And that's a huge difference. So I think it's, you know, it's important to understand how gamified systems work, but it's also, I think we need to break ourselves out of that as a model when we think about systems design it's not the only way to reconceive systems through through the lens of games um, it can actually be very productive to think just the opposite of a gamified system and think about a playified system um, as, a, as a way of, of um, reimagining what our institutions can be thank you uh, eric so maybe we take a last question um and the, this question we got uh, beforehand uh, from Katarina, a policy officer at the uh, Directorate for Justice in the European Commission. Um, and it also reminds me a little bit of the example that you uh, referred to with the Pokemon Go. Uh, so how do you uh, make such new communication inviting and engage, engaging, um, especially for new audiences uh, to, pro, uh, to avoid preaching to, to the converted already? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is a, this is a huge challenge, and this is why I focus on. This is why I think it's important to focus on models like the like urban living laboratories for and for a couple of reasons. One of the um, one of the um, uh, I don't know one of the this the sort of problems that that especially large institutions get into is that they become the face of the um, they become the face of the of the system that's being presented. So, you know, it's a government body, for example, or, or a, perhaps even a, a large development organization saying, um, you know, we're gonna do this outreach and, you know, and we're the face uh, of the outreach and you come engage with us. So we're setting the terms, you're engaging with us. That's the problem, right? Because the, um, and, and what needs to happen is that these, that large legacy organizations need to partner effectively with organizations that have trust within the communities that they're working with. And they need to be okay with not being the face of whatever it is that they're doing. So often I hear from government practitioners that, um, that they, they just don't understand why people are not engaging with them more. And what I say to them is that, you know, you um, government practitioner are getting paid to work in the government. You're asking people to volunteer their time to do whatever it is that you want them to do, but you're and and you're and you're lamenting the fact that they're not engaging in volunteer labor with an organization or an institution that they have no relationship with and they do not trust. Um, it's not surprising that that's not working out, right? So that that what instead what needs to happen is that um, again in, in my in the metric of of careful governance that what we need to do is that the, we need to sort of we need to move away from institutional decision-making and even the institution as face, the primary institution as face of whatever um, arrangement or forum you're setting up, that we need to enable and trust that there are other organizations that can be the face of those things. And so as essentially to get legitimacy, institutions, especially large institutions, need to be more comfortable and more trusting um, with, not being the center of attention um, and, and not always being the thing that, that we want publics to engage in. Instead, generating the forum, being at the table, um, but not having your, your logo in the center of the table, right? Like that's really the, the shift that needs to happen. And, and it's, it's, a diff, it's a difficult one because if, if, the, if the big institution is paying for the thing, they want that outcome. Um, they want they want brand recognition, but that's something that has to change culturally. 
So uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Eric, for uh, for this uh, interesting talk and for uh, answering the, the question from the audience. Um, if you want to follow more of, of Professor Eric Garden's um, work, uh, do read his do read his book, uh, Meaningful Inefficiencies. Uh, and it's for me then over to uh, to announce uh, the next talk of this series uh, in the flamboyant phase. Uh, and this talk will be given by uh, by the Dutch neuropsychologist uh, Margriet Sietzkorn. Uh, together with Margriet Sietzkorn, we will explore how our brain is manipulated. So be aware. Uh, she is convinced uh, she will be uh, she will manipulate our brain even during this this talk. Uh, however, uh, she will also explain how we can defend ourselves against brain hacking and how we can update our brain in order to be better equipped for today's world. Uh, she will speak on, uh, on about this on Thursday, 29th of April. Uh, so if you don't want to miss this talk, uh, please subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel by, clip it, by clicking subscribe below. Uh, and if you are clo living close to Brussels, of course, visit our museum uh, and our temporary exhibition, uh, Fake For Real. Uh, even during COVID time, we are open every, every weekend. Uh, so for now, thanks again, uh, especially you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Eric Gordon. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you all at home for following and participating in, in today's uh, talk uh, and hope to see you uh, again. Uh, have a good evening and you have a good day, uh, Eric. Bye.